National Maritime Museum. This is part two of Needle on Skin. And this evening's session is primarily on maritime tattooing in the UK. I'm really pleased that we have joining us once again, Dr. Matt Lauder, Senior Lecturer in Art History and Theory and Director of American Studies at the University of Essex. And as I said last week, he's a go-to guy for tattooing in all its context. Um, so just before we start, hi Matt, how are you doing? Hello, sorry about that, I was just finishing my cup of tea. <laughs> no <Yeah>. worries. <laughs> <laughs> we are all at home and uh, for any of the viewers, if you have your tipple ready, um, we are almost ready. Um, just to remind you that there's an opportunity to um, ask Matt questions at the end of the session as last week via the chat feed and the Q&A feature. So please do that if you have any questions, we will feel them to Matt at the end. And uh, also this evening, we've got Shahira and Matt Cahill, who are making sure everything runs smoothly behind the scenes. Um, so without further ado, um, we're gonna take our deep dive. So Matt, last week you said um, that tattoos are a medium and not a phenomenon. Can you explain the statement, please? Yeah, so um, I, I hope some people were here last week. Um, those of you that weren't, we, we talked a lot about the kind of pre-history, so kind of real early histories of, of tattooing in this country. Um, and that phrase, the phrase that tattooing is a medium, not a phenomenon, is a phrase I use a lot because, you know, I'm often as a tattoo historian asked to talk about tattooing in uh, in contexts where tattooing has a different kind of role than it does in, in British history. So to talk about tattooing in New Zealand or Samoa or the Arctic or the Americas, for example. And whilst I do and talk about those practices occasionally, and I specifically talk about them where, you know, where, where they um, encounter and are affected and, and um, affect tattooing in, in Britain, um, I, I never sort of proclaim to be an expert in that kind of stuff. Basically because, you know, just because it's marks in the skin, um, just because the kind of technology, just kind of the uh, phenomenology of those things are the same, doesn't mean they're, they're the same practices. You know, I sort of compare it to colleagues of mine who work on Renaissance frescoes or something. They wouldn't be called to talk about cave paintings just because it's paint on a, on a wall. Um, and so, you know, in, in the context of, of today's talk or today's discussion about maritime tattooing, I guess really what, what I, I'm interested in um, is to think about not just kind of how tattooing is met, how things are, tattoos are made and how, um, you know, sort of specific features of a, of a tattoo as a kind of thing in the world, but I'm really interested in the images, I'm really interested in, you know, what has been done with that technology of sticking a sharp thing in the, in the skin. Um, by different groups at different times. Okay, great. Yeah, because I mean, that was something I noticed a few people said <clears throat> to me afterwards. It's like, oh, you know, that it is a phenomenon, which means it only kind of happens every once in a while that it, but, but as we found out from last week, it's been, it's always been happening. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 um, that's, just, that's the other kind of use of that word, phenomenon, I suppose, right? That, that, that tattooing um, has always been sort of said to come, and, to, to, to come and go. And we always hear that tattooing is this hot new trend. You know, everyone's doing it now. Um, and again, what we talked about last week and what we'll talk about today as well is, is just how present tattooing is really. Quite the contrary. It doesn't seem to kind of go away and re-emerge. It, it does wax and wane in popularity uh, mm -hmm. over time. But it's really this kind of constant presence. Like, tattooing is always always around um and the idea to, to fit into today's theme of maritime tattooing like the idea that tattooing was at some point in the past just for sailors and is now for some other you know now everyone's doing it um is another part of kind of the the, the myths and mythologies that i want to yeah i mean reading through some of the f articles because you've read you've written many articles and i know you're writing two books um, you have argued that, er, um, that early Euro-American maritime tattooing can only be understood in relation to the broader visual culture from which it emerged. Can you expand right. a bit on that for us, please? Yeah, so that's a sort of slightly um, pretentious academic way of saying that people <laughs> tat 
tattoo on their bodies the images that they find around them in the world, right? So um, maybe it's time for some images. Let me find the right uh, image set. I've got those different image, image okay. sets open here. Um, so yeah, what I mean by that, I suppose, really, uh, and, it, and it, in some senses it's not surprising, um, is that the images that people tattoo on their bodies are the images that resonate with them um, in, uh, in other mediums, right? Uh, and the kind of images that they uh, make and encounter in other formats. So um, I'm just going to bring up yeah, uh, an I mean, image, which actually is an object from your collection in the Maritime Museum. Um, let me uh, do the magic and switch okay. to the right format. Um, so if we, uh, like, here we go. So this okay. is an object, um, it's a tobacco tin. Uh, that is in the collection of the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich um, from 1782. Um, and you can see like inscribed on it, like these, what I guess to kind of modernize what to us looks like tattoo images. And of course they are tattoo images to some degree, right? You can see there's a, um, uh, there is a like pierced heart, there's some swallows, some anchors, some moons. Mm -hmm. um, and what I guess I want to say about that really is that the images that we sort of imagine are tattoo images and that sort of come to define tattooing, particularly in this kind of maritime imagination, um, you know, actually are images that we find all over the kind of visual culture of, the, um, of life at sea. So it's the same kind of images that people were scratching into, the into their tobacco tins, that they were darning into their socks. Um, you know, every, every sailor had a needle, every sailor, I suppose, still does hasn't have a needle in their uh, kit. And so given enough time and opportunity, some of them are going to scratch uh, designs into um, kind of coins, into bits of uh, scrimshaw, into kind of whale bone and things like that. And some of them are going to tattoo themselves. And actually, rather than being a set of dis di uh, different practices, it's actually really all part, I want to argue, of the same kind of image making um, process. Okay. Um, just a little thing. Your voice is going a little bit in and out. Oh, okay. Sorry. I don't know what to Sorry. say about that. Yeah. That's, that's okay. okay. I'll see if I can. That's grand. So, as you, um, so this tobacco tin that we're looking at right now, that wouldn't have, those images wouldn't have been on there. That was something that the sailors did in their free time while, you know, my microphone they're there for um, months and months. Yeah. Away. Yeah. Yeah, exactly that. So, um, the, you know, the, the, there's a sort of saying that I encountered in this book of sailor handicrafts once where the author said, you know, sailors cannot leave their mark upon the sea, <laughs> right? You, so um, the idea that you can uh, use what's around you to kind of make a mark um, is a fairly kind of compelling one. Mm. And yeah, so those tobacco tins would have been part of the, you know, the equipment that, that sailors had um, in the 18th century for their pipe tobacco. And of course, just like a kind of schoolboy with a compass, you're scratching designs into it. Um, yeah, and yeah. often, you know, it's the same, it's the same process to, to almost to, to kind of use that needle to put the, the mark in your skin, um, as opposed to put it in the back of an object like that. Uh, and if we look at the, uh, oh, if we look at the front of it as well, right? This is the front of the same box. Uh, it's inscribed with the kind of, um, a kind of motto. Um, and exactly, that's the same kind of thing that we, you know, we see in tattooing, right? Okay, can we read that motto just for anyone watching? So, uh, oh, you're gonna have to, I'm going to have to remind myself of what it says now. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember what it says. and It's quite difficult to read. Oh, um, okay. It's a kind of romantic, it's a romantic slogan. I have got it written down somewhere, but I haven't got it handy. <laughs> there you go, you put me on the spot. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, it doesn't matter. Um, just wondering. So these these things that they were scratching in, which have then sort of, I guess, become sailor tattoos. Um, the the longing, the the anchors, things that they were seeing around them. Yeah. So the the imagery, you know, in some senses, oh. whether it's it's on tattooing or or otherwise. The, um, the iconography is not that complicated. This is a love token. So it's a very small um, coin that would have been rubbed down to its kind of, um, you know, to be flat. And then it's scratched in with the design. This has got an anchor on it and a heart and EE, presumably the, not the mobile phone network, but the <laughs> initials, um, initials of, of, of uh, whoever this was, was kind of love, you know, the love of his life. 
Um, and yeah, those are the kind of images we see a lot, right? Maritime images of, of, of anchors and, and hearts, images of um, being part of the, the Navy. So they sort of symbolize brotherhood or they symbolize kind of fraternity to some degree. Um, also, you know, the symbolism of anchors, for example, is quite straightforward. They're, they're indicative, indicative of safety. They're indicative of port. Um, they're indicative of kind of being, um, you know, settled. They're a kind of image of stability and a kind of very unstable life, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, as a sailor, they're the only thing that's between you and sort of death at, at some time. So those images are pretty straightforward. We find kind of images of hearts, right? So, um, yeah. Again, tokens of love pierced with arrows to kind of symbolize the pain of loss or being away from your loved one. Um, and, we, and we see um, um, uh, maritime images, you know, images of, the, uh, of being at sea. So we'll see things like uh, on that tobacco tin, moons and stars, kind of navigational symbols. Of course. Or we see images like this, like this is another coin, um, mermaids. Right, mermaids are quite common. Um, you know, you can understand why a young man at sea, uh, away from uh, his wife and his girlfriend, and any kind of um, erotic stimulation, might be drawn to kind of imagine the um, nubile charms of a a young buxom mermaid. Yeah, um, and what what really interests me, you know, is exactly not just kind of how similar these images in coins and, and tobacco tins are to tattooing images, but how um, similar they are to actually tattoos. So um, I've got now, uh, my next image is actually uh, some human skin. So if you're preserved human skin, so if you're a bit squeamish, there's a slight warning for you. Um, but like, this is a piece of preserved skin um, from the Gordon Museum collection from around the same period as that coin. It's a sailor's um, forearm uh, in a, a wet preservation kind of in a jar of formaldehyde right. with um a britannia on it you can see that at the top that kind of patriotic yeah. uh, symbol but at the bottom there there's that mermaid again with her mirror uh, um, with her um with her long hair just you know a very very straightforward kind of image of a bored you know a bored teenage boy uh, sexually frustrated uh, away at sea i suppose do you know how old that is how old the preserved skin is yeah, so that will be probably a little bit later than those um, coins, but middle of the 19th century, maybe kind of 18, uh, 1850s, something like that. Right, and the coins and the, the box would probably, like, is that late 18th yeah, The coin is earlier. The coin, the, huh. the, the box was in the, the 17, uh, uh, late 18th century. The coins are about coincident with this, so mid-19th mid, mid right. century. So... Basically, so a lot of sailors in that time were using their um, needle that they had and, and all the time and space that they had to express themselves. Like you said, these are like craft and folk practices almost to be drawing on etching on things and expressing. Yeah, and we find, you know, in, in some sailor um, diaries, and we have a few from this period, it's often the kind of guy on board the ship who's the most artistically competent, the guy who's making models of ships and things like that um, out of bits of splinter wood, is also the tattooist on board. Um, oh. You know, there, there was a, um, one particular uh, diary that I cite in an article that I, I wrote, which is exactly that. It's, it's, it's the guy who was, you know, one moment he was using his needle to, to etch some coins and the next minute he's using it to, to tattoo um, himself and others. Um, and of course, you know, it's, it's a very kind of intimate practice on board the ships in the, in the 19th century, as you can imagine. Um, and it, 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 it's done at a time, you know, often at times of, of there's, you know, boredom, there's not much wind, um, you haven't got much to do, you've got a needle, you've got the means to make ink. So the inks would have been made from either lamp black, oh, soot, um, yeah. or even gunpowder um, mixed with a kind of alcohol solution often. Uh, so you've got the kind of ink, you've got the needles, you've got... Um, thread you need to kind of hold the ink and then you've got the time to do it you know um and 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 the kind of you know opportunity to do it so there's a real there's a real kind of means motive and opportunity uh, that happens i think that links tattooing and, and and the maritime communities with which it's so indelibly linked you know yeah 
Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things I've always, like, I have an interest in tattoos, but I've always wondered why people get names written on them. Um, you know, because it's like, don't you remember who you're in love with? Like, what's <laughs> I know that's a very narrow way of looking at it. But, um, I mean, that was, that sort of came from that time as well, or that <clears throat> they're longing for their loved ones. They were away in sea for such a long time, I guess, that they would have etched out the names on tins or on their skin. Is that right? Yeah. So um, you know, here's so here's a here's a lovely image. This is an image oh. that belongs to uh, Lal Hardy, uh, the tattooist who's got a tattoo collection of some historical artifacts. This is on display um, in my exhibition at the moment, which I think we'll talk about later on. Okay. Um, yeah. So we don't know the exact date of this, but it's it's um, kind of a popular print from the again latter decades of the 19th century, okay. and you can see hopefully in the image. Um, I'll make it full screen actually um, so you can see it um you can see him like tattooing his initials or their initials on his arm j and n and on his arm he's got n and j where he's tattooed she's obviously tattooed him as well and they've had this sort of exchange of um, designs while he's gone away to see um and i think uh and i can oh, zoom yeah. in as well so let's do uh, I can see, see that. that zoom in there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, tattooing your kind of loved one's name is a pretty common thing, obviously still today. Mm -hmm. But it's a, you know, it's a reminder when you're away from home and you, you haven't got loads of possessions and you can't carry much with you. And, you know, you don't have kind of, you know, jewellery and things like that. But it's a way of, um, it's a way of remembering and memorialising your, um, your love and your and your your the permanent commitment that you're making you know, that, to your loved one and hopefully that you'll come home you'll come home safe you know <laughs> yeah i mean well, sorry where's that painting from where i don't know it's a so it's a popular print that so where oh, the original okay. is and 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 the more details about it we don't know um it's just in a private collection and um, printed on newsprint um but we don't really have any details of, of really any any more than that if anyone knows i'd be really interested yeah it's a it's it's a really nice one and just to describe it a bit more so it's a a loved one and the sailor um standing by a window yeah so it's a it's a it's a, um, on their faces it's a young it's a young young girl again i'll bring it up sorry i'm um, yeah. i'm trying to multi multitask with my images here you're doing a great job uh, so yeah it's an image of a um of a uh late 19th century mid 19th century jack tar a kind of guy young boy in his sailor t sailor outfit um with his wife or girlfriend obviously about to head off to sea um she's holding out her arm and he's tattooing there on her arm uh two interlinked hearts and the initials j and n uh -huh. um and on his arm he already has a tattoo just under his sleeve um n and n and j and it looks like he's about to leave. He's got his hat on and everything. So yeah, he's got his hat on, and and obviously the fleet is kind of, is kind of uh, you know is uh, is there in the background. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, as about to leave to go to sea. And these. It's, I a, mean, it's a beautiful image, and I, I it sort of sums up really exactly kind of what, what one of the things I say all the time that tattooing is part of these maritime cultures, but we also find it you know in that wider world. This is here a tattoo um, on on a. A young woman as well at the same period. Um, so they give us so like like these these things like the scrimshaws that I'm sure you have images of that and um, the boxes that they drew on. They kind of give us a glimpse into people's uh, place on the ship, um, or and then like a broader collective social fabric. Yeah, so it's here. difficult. It's difficult in this period. There's not many images of of tattooing. Um, so yeah, you mentioned scrimshaw. I've uh -huh. got um, I've got a nice scrimshaw image here. I think. No, we've got some in our museum. Um, whale bone and yeah. Um, so yeah, um, you know the kind of images that that we do find um, on uh, on on things that aren't tattooing but kind of resemble tattooing. Yeah. Are a way for us. Are a way for us to kind of, I think, get a sense of the kind of images, um, the kind of images that you know maybe um, would have been tattooed. Because otherwise, we're we're sort of re reliant on. Um, here's some screenshots. 
we're sort of reliant on, uh, you know, often text descriptions in records. We, we, we have a few written and drawings of tattooing at the period, but um, it's often difficult to work out what tattooing might have looked like. Um, and so looking at the kind of parallel uh, image you know, kinds, the kind of ways in which uh, sailors are making images in other, in other surfaces and other mediums, I think we can kind of try and figure out what tattooing might have looked like um, at the period. This is a piece of Scrimshaw um, from the National Maritime Museum in Cornwall. Uh, it's, a, it's a tooth of some animal, probably a um, shark maybe, or a whale. Um, inscribed with a really beautiful um, image of a, a, a woman with her hair down. Um, and we find, you know, descriptions which say things like image of a woman. Um, and while not many of them would have been this elaborate, certainly some of them may well have been. Um, yeah, I know that certainly we have some images um, on Scrimshaw at the um, National Maritime Museum, and they've got like whole ships and whole stories going on just on maybe a piece of whalebone or um and very detailed very beautiful you know like yeah that. and it's you know again it's 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 often difficult to really kind of unpick exactly what's going on here uh, there in terms of tattooing but i think we can we can make a kind of fairly educated guess as to how um the tattoos of the period might have looked like i mean um where we do have images this is a uh, an image from um, a painting, actually, from one of the very few paintings of sailor tattooing um, from the mid-19th century. It's in the House of Lords. It's by Daniel MacLeese. Um, and it's a, it's a, there's two huge murals, one of which commemorates the Battle of Waterloo, one of which commemorates the Battle of Trafalgar. And of, uh, the Battle of Trafalgar in particular has a lot of this kind of thing, lots of bare-chested men um, dying very gallantly at, at, while Nelson himself passes away. And many of these guys have tattoos drawn upon them. Uh, and the artist, a guy called Daniel McLeese, like he was quite interested in kind of historical accuracy. Um, and so whether he interviewed Trafalgar veterans, they would have been quite old by this point because it's about 50 years after the battle, or whether he worked on then contemporary tattooing in the 1860s, we don't know. But um, when you see tattoos like this guy's got on his um, chest or the guy next to him on his arm, again, if I make this a full screen, yeah. Uh, you can see it better. Um, so you can see the guy whose arm is visible in this detail um, has quite an elaborate oh. tattoo of a cross um, and the name, probably Nancy. Um, and then the guy dying in front of him with that blood running from his chest has tattoos yeah. which say Sue, marks of a, um, uh, you know, of the crown and of an anchor, some hearts, and that kind of thing, uh, which I think is probably some, some red, maybe. I mean, um, it but you can see that, you know, so tattooing is, is not a kind of uncomplex practice. It's fairly rudimentary compared to the images we have today, I suppose. Um, but it's, you know, there's a whole range of kind of image making styles that are happening in the period. Is, is there a problem, I mean, for historians like yourself who are looking into this, that tattoos usually disappear with the person? Um, we lose those artifacts, really. There aren't very many. I mean, is there an answer to that or... Right, so so I showed you some of those preserved tattooed skins, and we have yeah. a few of those. Um, not many, uh, but we have some. Um, the other way uh, we can do, I mean, here's another one. If I share this with you, uh, like so, so we we do have so we do have some preserved skin, right? So mm -hmm. um, so you can see, like you know, here's some here's some preserved skin. Uh, this is actually a French example, but again, there's that mermaid. Um, example very again. Very prevalent, yeah. Um, very prevalent. Um, but otherwise, we're sort of reliant on, um, you know, we're reliant on things like, uh, you know, record books. And this oh. is sort of where I think a lot of the myths and misconceptions come about the kind of range of tattooing that we find. Because, Perfect, yeah. you know, only certain kinds of tattoos get recorded um, for posterity. Uh -huh. uh, and, and, and obviously sailors are the kind of people who have their bodies recorded, certainly in the 19th century. Um, and so when historians like myself go looking for tattooing, one of the places we find it is in, is in the sailor records. So um, this is an image from uh, the work of a, uh, an academic back in the 80s called Ira Dye, who went through lots of American seamen certificates. Uh -huh. And he kind of documented and drew some of the images that he found or, or, or that were drawn in those seamen's records. Um, you know, you've got everything from the from the anchor and the names and those those images with the hearts interlinked to 
Hibernia, the kind of um, name for Ireland, uh, and dates and things like that. Christograms symbolizing religious faith. Um, or, you know, in the, in the collection of the National Maritime Museum, uh, in your collection at the uh, Royal, Royal Museum's Greenwich, we find things like this. So this is um, a scene from a uh, record book that was belonged to um, Captain Edward Rotherham of HMS Bellor Bellerophon um, uh, up to between 1799 and 1708. Um, and it's just one column from one page. And again, you maybe can't make out in huge detail what's being said here, but this is in the kind of distinguishing marks column. Um, and you can see, uh, you can see crucifix, TW, um, a heart with some crosses through it, an anchor. And then later on, you see um, at the bottom there, a centaur, a big kind of, you know, mystical beast, MS, um, and heart on left, crucifix, sun, moon on right. So, right. We've, so we have to go looking for kind of evidence of historical tattooing in places like this, in places like record books. I mean, um, the other, I'm sorry, yeah. The I other place we can pretty, look yeah. um, is, you know, is in um, prison records. So again, there's an idea that tattooing and criminality are very linked. And of course they are to some degree, but that's really heightened by the fact that um, tattooing and, um, uh, you know, when historians go looking for tattooing, another place they can find it is in the records of jails. Uh -huh. And so this is again a nice maritime one from the Suffolk jail record book dated the 2nd of July, 1842. And you can see very helpfully, the jailer has um, done a little artistic representation of a moon, uh, sorry, a sun marked on the right, an anchor um, on the arm, thistle, mermaids on the left, some names there, um, yeah. and then a cross with a date. And so, you know, we've, and then even more brilliantly, uh, on the other arm, um, this again, buxom, uh, bare chested mermaid, um, very similar to that one we saw on the coin yeah. I showed you earlier on. Good stuff. Um, I mean, does, oh, uh, sorry, I forgot my train of thought there. Um, <laughs> there. There is a misconception, is there, that sailors were encouraged to have the markings to identify themselves, that this is something that people think that is not quite true. I mean, they just had them anyway. Yeah, or? so certainly um, tattoos did prove useful for identifying bodies that were washed up on shore. Uh -huh. Um uh, that certainly was the case, and 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 um, you know, there were actually kind of admirals in the navy who did sort of suggest that maybe it'd be a good idea if men were enlisted and tattooed on enlistment. I mean, part of the part of this um, this desire actually to record everyone in so much detail was because obviously, obviously there was desertion from the navy, uh -huh. um, and and there was press ganging. So the idea of recording people so they couldn't run away once they'd enlisted was quite important. Um, as well as, as you said, identifying bodies um, when they, uh, when, you know, if people were lost at sea or, or, or right. whatever. I mean, um, probably maybe at this stage in, if the people who are listening, they might imagine that like a lot of the sailors, deckhands, uh, able seamen and shipmates, rather than admirals and the captains were the ones having tattoos. But that's not quite strictly true because of visibility. We don't see them, perhaps. Right, yeah. So um, it's certainly the case that, you know, most of the tattooing we have recorded is on, you know, your kind of middle ranks. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, in one case in the US, in the US Navy, there was a, a nice example where um, this guy complained that he was sort of brought up for tattooing and he was sort of told off for tattooing. And he said, well, why, why are you guys allowed to do scrimshaw and I'm not allowed to tattoo myself? So it certainly was a kind of association with, with a particular kind of rank. But of course, particularly as we get into the latter decades of the 19th century, and particularly um, with, with tattooing in Japan, lots of the um, officer class and the admirals were getting very high end, very expensive, very, um, you know, very kind of complex tattooing. Um, and for example, I mean, I've got this amazing image, uh, well, sort of a couple of amazing images here, which I can show you. Um, from the 1880s, which um, are of uh, George V, um, the future King of England, the sort of sailor prince um, getting tattooed in Japan, or at least um, the imagination of what that might have looked like. This is a great image, actually. So this is um, from 1880. 
uh, and it depicts a kind of rumor that was going around that um, George and his brother um, Albert, uh, Albert Victor, had been tattooed on their noses. <laughs> um, it was just a rumor they hadn't been tattooed on their noses, unfortunately. Um, in fact, <laughs> Uh, uh, their mother wrote them a letter saying, you stupid boys, why don't you get tattooed somewhere more, <laughs> less conspicuous? But it, uh, and so this is a kind of imagination cartoon in the papers at the time of, of these handsome young princes um, with, with big tattoos on their noses, um, anchors on their noses, tattoos on their neck, big sort of um, sun rises on their stomachs. Right. Um, it turns out, uh, you can see that also they've got obviously the, the, the princely, you know, the, the um, white feathers of the Prince of Wales, uh, uh -huh. their father tattooed on their, on, on their caps or, or tucked into their caps. So this is sort of a fiction, but um, a, a, shortly after this, they, the, the, their ships docked in Japan um, and they did get tattooed. Um, we know from records. Um, let me find the right image. So, I mean, like, it, so, yeah. so this, is, this is an image in, 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 telling the story, at least, of, of, of George getting tattooed in Japan. Um, and that was actually a fairly common thing for fairly high ranking officials um, in the British Navy and, and, and more widely in Japan to get tattooed. So the, the tattoo sort of bug, I suppose, like spans the whole, you know, whole gamut. Right. I mean, do we know what he had? Did you say it was a dragon or? Yeah. So, so he had a, he had a dragon, obviously, right. Being George. Um, we don't have any, annoyingly don't have any photographs um, of it. Um, uh -huh. It wasn't the dumb thing for the, the, for people to go around with their sleeves rolled up. Sure. Um, but uh, this is this is certainly at least the claim by one tattooist of what it might have looked like. This is all this is almost certainly a kind of fiction, but um, you can see that how tattooing and the kind of um, you know nautical imagination becomes linked with the Orient and with travel quite quickly. Right. And I think what's quite interesting, and again, if I if I find you another image, I think like if you compare it to a um, an, an image we do have, and again, this is another image. It's a little bit gruesome. It's not that bad, but um, like this is an image from a medical journal uh, from around the same time, showing um, syphilis. Okay. Uh, and again, if I zoom in on that for you, uh, yeah. you can see it's a it's a um, a photo engraving of a syphilitic outbreak on a sailor who had been tattooed by a guy at Portsmouth who in between clients was licking his needles to clean them Ooh. off um, and had oral oh. syphilis. Um, so we kind of have these kind of images, which is, you know, a, 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 an image of a woman um, tattooed on this guy's arm, but really infected with quite deep syphilitic sores. Wow. Um, I'll transition off that and go back to, back to, um, to George for that. But yeah. Um, so, so, so that kind of very high end, very kind of quote unquote artistic tattooing that was encountered in Japan became a kind of real way for the officer classes to really demarcate the quality of the kind of work they were getting done. Fine. Um, so we, we can get on to talking about Captain George Creasy. Um, it's... Yeah. So skipping forward a century. I mean, oh, the whole century. Um, oh, we'll go back again. But I, I would like to see. Yeah, yeah. I think that's so. He's. I mean, he's another good good person to talk about in the context of this sort of visual culture angle, I suppose, and and the story of how we can, um, you know, how we can kind of work out what's going on. So yeah, George Creasy um, was the admiral of the submarine fleet. Uh, at the, uh, during World War II. Uh -huh. And there's a bust of him in your collection at the National Maritime Museum. Here he is, kind of very chiselled, handsome guy. Yeah. Um, but really curiously, um, on the back of the sculpture uh, is, an, is, is an engraving. Um, and again, if I make this large, you can see. Um, so this is the back of a, a, a portrait bust, basically life-size. Um, and it's inscribed with... Um, an image that really looks like a tattoo. It's a um, merman holding a big kind of um, trident and he is um, striking at a dragon with some uh -huh. Nazi swastikas around it, right? Symbolism is right. quite straightforward. The submarine fleet, the merman comes out of the sea and kind of, you know, defeats the Nazi dragon. Yeah. Um, it's unclear whether this is actually a tattoo or not, I have to say. So, um, 
it it looks very I've much looked, like the um, etchings on some of the things you showed us earlier. The same kind of imagery, similar, and right. the way it's done exactly. Yeah. And I've you know I've I've made the argument that if so, I've looked for kind of evidence that Creasy himself was tattooed. Again, photographs he of, he often has his he often has his collar on, and you can't really see. Um, one expert in, in the work of the sculptor who made this bust, a guy called Charles Wheeler, did say to me, oh, it's a decorative addition on the sculpture, it's not a tattoo. Um, none of the other sculptures that Wheeler did at the time have this mark on them, but in any case, even if it's not a real tattoo, it certainly looks like one. Uh -huh. um, and my argument there is really that, you know, such is the kind of link between tattooing and this kind of imagery, and um, we can't help but read this, this design um, as a tattoo mark you know and as you said it really is a nice kind of link for me to that historical link to those kind of bronze and brass um tobacco tins that we were looking at earlier on cool is is there still a ban in the navy actually uh regarding tattoos in on certain areas of the body so in the contemporary royal navy um no it, it's varied over historical time but as you know as more and more people have gotten tattoos and as the kind of um, ability of the Royal Navy to recruit, and actually this is true of the other forces too, um, to recruit has gotten harder. They've, they've relaxed their um, uniform regulations. So for a long time, it was actually um, banned to get tattooed anywhere that was visible in your dress uniform. Um, now it's basically only visible, it's only banned to get tattooed anywhere that's visible um, uh, from front on. So you can get the side of your neck tattooed now, even in the Royal Navy, um, as long as it's not anything offensive. Um, right. racist or, 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 or salacious um, but they basically they, they, tattooing was such a kind of important part of the maritime culture and actually you know so many young kids uh, were coming into the navy with tattoos already um, and yeah. they were finding kind of real heavy restrictions very hard to enforce Fine. so we we see the sort of link um between uh what's recorded the newspapers or at least um naval records you mentioned Crim, um, you know, jail records, prison records. So they had, they keep these records. So that's why we have some evidence of stuff. Um, where, where do we start to get the link between criminality and tattoos? Is it from these records? Um, I'm thinking of the Forty Thieves story. Oh yeah. So um, <clears throat> obviously, again, there's a kind of popular idea that tattooing and criminality are kind of inextricably linked. And of course, again, you know, we find tattooing in um, naval cultures, right? Uh, let me find the right image here. Uh, actually, I don't have that handy, but I can, okay. it's, a more of a, it's more of a written, it's more of a written thing than an image anyway. So okay. Carry this one. Um, so yeah, right. So this idea that tattooing and, and, and criminality go together is really, is linked together, but it doesn't really kick off in Britain until um, quite late, although it comes into European criminology quite early. So in the late 19th century, criminologists in France and in Italy um, did studies of the criminal man, right? And that's what the name of one of the books, the Norma Criminelle by Lombroso. And the idea was it's linked to this idea at the time in, in sort of scientific racism, really, that you can tell from someone's body, from someone's character, what they're like as a person. And that leads, you know, to the Second World War and, and, and the horrors of, of the Holocaust eventually. Um, but it's a big part of 19th century science that we, you can study people's bodies. And there's an idea that certainly you know, it, it, it was present in things like physiognomy, the idea that the uglier someone is, the more kind of stupid they are. Oh, okay. Or in racial science, the idea that you could tell someone's kind of intelligence or you know, phrenology even, that you could read someone's head. And of course they went to prisons and there was lots of tattooing in prison for the same reasons um, that uh, sailors tattooed themselves, prisoners do too. It's a way to mark yourself in a way, in a, in a culture where you're otherwise not meant to stand out. It's a way of passing the time, all this kind of stuff. So they encountered a lot of tattooing in prisons, um, but didn't bother to do any control testing to find out how much tattooing there wasn't outside of prisons. Yeah. So, so certainly in the European uh, scientific imagination, tattooing and criminality were very linked. One um, uh, criminologist said that tattoos were the stigmata of the criminal man. I have a tattooed man that was died at liberty. It was only a matter of time before he would have committed a crime. Right? Okay. If you've got a tattoo, you're a criminal. <laughs> and if you're not a criminal, it's just because you hadn't got round to committing your crime yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So in, in Britain, what happened was, there's an amazing example of this. 
so for about 30, 40 years, actually, um, uh, beginning in the kind of early 18th, 19th century and going all the way through, there's all these reports of this tattooed gang in London, uh, the, ta the 40 thieves, and they were all found with the mark of the 40 thieves. And the mark of the 40 thieves, like weirdly sort of changes between story to story. So sometimes it's dots, sometimes it's a ring around the finger, sometimes it's a name or an, an initial. Um, and it really just took one kind of smart cop eventually to realize that there wasn't just a, there wasn't a gang of tattooed pickpockets. It was just that, you know, many of the t pickpockets that he um, arrested happened to be tattooed. <laughs> Okay. Um, and so, you know, if you, if you only look at tattooing, for, for tattooing in certain places, if you only look in prison records and, and Navy records, then you'll, ha you'll end up with a very skewed um, idea of, of what tattooing culture looks like. Kind of, I mean, of course, you know, even in, even in records like that, if you look more carefully, you find more kind of um, intricate stories. So, for example, in the kind of com there's lots of tattooing in the convict. Uh -huh. records, the stories yeah. of people who were transported to Australia and elsewhere. Um, and of course, in there, almost by definition, you're looking at a criminal subset. But we also then find, you know, tattoo marks recorded that indicate professions, so blacksmithing, for example. Um, also, and, and there's, you know, there's a sense, even in these criminal records, of a kind of wider vernacular tattoo history. Yeah, I mean, because also, I mean, the, um, so many, like when you read history books about the supposed convicts that were deported to Australia, a lot of people weren't even convicts. They were just, right. a lot of the women were just sort of, they might have just been living with the man and it's like, oh, you're a prostitute. And then that was just a way of getting rid or getting some women over to Australia. They weren't. Yeah, exactly. And they were just people. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting in a way this kind of link with criminality and, 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 and um, particularly on women actually with tattooing has a real deep hist historical kind of impact because, um, for example, there's, there was lots of tattooing discovered and, and is, is increasingly discovered on ancient Egyptian mummies, mm -hmm. right, and particularly on women, uh, female mummies. And of course, when these were being discovered, it's exactly at this period in, in the late 19th century by European um, archaeologists and colonial explorers and they're, go, they're sort of saying, oh, this, this female specimen has tattoos. She must have been a prostitute. Yeah. And sort of decades of archaeology assumed that these tattooed female mummies were kind of concubines or, or, or erotic kind of companions or, or something like that. And actually, you know, new research is, is, is turning up that really they weren't anything of the sort. They were, they were ritualists. They were priestesses. They were high-ranking high female members of the community. But these particular kind of prejudices around tattooing from the 19th century and onwards have actually clouded our understanding of tattooing much more, and it's, much more generally. It sounds kind of like a lazy way just to sort of uh, throw everybody into one sort of subsect or whatever, that that's what they were. It's, it's kind of easy, a bit lazy. Yeah, well, if you, if you have this idea that, that what you have on your body is indicative of your character, um, then... You know, tattooing is the most easily readable version of that, this kind of dermal diagnostic version. Um, I mean, one, one of the, sorry, one of the things that I read as well was that a lot of women um, were getting uh, things like jewellery and beads and things like that tattooed on them because it was like, it may have cost some money, but it was a cheaper way than having, than actually buying jewellery. Yeah, I mean, so when we come to tattooing in, in women in particular, um, you know, I think the history of tattooing skews more male than female, but there are, I think, much more, much more women than men, much more men, much more women in the history than I think people often imagine. Um, the tattooing on women, you know, iconographically expands a lot of the same things we've been talking about, um, particularly where the women are kind of um, in related cultures, so the, the mothers and wives of servicemen uh, often have similar tattooing on them. And that's true for, from the 19th century all the way through to the present day. Um, when we come to kind of the more fashion tattooing, the more kind of commercial tattooing that begins in the 19th century, um, yes, most a lot of the tattooing on women is, is in places where they'd often wear jewelry or where they'd have patterned um, stockings. So for example, again, I, let me find the images here, but like um, a lot of the tattooing on women uh, that we have on travellers to Japan is quite similar to um, 
the designs that, that would have been fashionable in, you know, in, again, in other kind of forms of visual culture. So um, this image, for example, um, is of a, um, some stockings, um, right, uh, yeah. from the late 19th century, some embroidered silk stockings. Wow. Um, and again, you know, that's the kind of image, same kind of imagery that, that women were getting tattooed on their, on their legs and the same kind of place. Um, there's another one. This is a great one uh, from the V&A, uh, a, a really beautiful um, um, uh, embroidered beautiful. stocking with green sequins with a snake. And if we look at, like, for example, this image, this is an image of Virginia Courtauld, a very high end. Uh, you know, she was a, um, married into a very wealthy family, Italian kind of aristocratic woman. Um, and she's got, you can probably see in that small image there, if I again make it big, um, you can see on her leg, there's a kind of snake peeking out there on her lower leg. And there's, and if I zoom in, um, you can see uh, on her leg. So that would have been done, you know, as a traveler, as a, as a, as a visitor to Japan in that late 19th century. Um, and again, on the lower leg. And we often find, you know, similar things, similar designs uh, or, or, or things on, on wrists discussed. As well. Yeah. I mean, um, again, reading from some of your work and, and uh, there's a preconception that Captain Cook rediscovered tattooing in the, in, in the Pacific and brought it back to the West. I mean, there is like a um, fairly contentious exhibition that they, you, that they had tattooed heads and they showed them in right. and what happened to them. Right. So, so again, you know, this is again taking us right back to kind of the early days of maritime ah. tattooing and certainly I think the idea that we looked at those, some of those record books earlier on. And one of the yeah. reasons I think that, that, that Pacific scholars believed that tattooing originated in the, in the, in the that tattooing originated in the Pacific was partly because that's when the Royal Navy during the Napoleonic Wars started keeping records. Uh -huh. So in that period after the Pacific encounters, all of a sudden there's loads of tattooing present in the, in the service records. Um, the word tattoo itself comes from the Polynesian word uh, tatau. Um, the word tattoo actually did exist in English beforehand, and it still does um, in a lesser usage, meaning a drum beat, beating a tattoo. Uh -huh. um, this onomatopoeic word. Um, tattooing in, in Tahiti is done with a tapping motion. And you, so this, it's also kind of onomatopoeic, possibly. Tattoo, tattoo. Yeah. So you can see how sailors heard that word and think, oh, tattoo. Yeah, we know tattoo. Tattoo, that's the word. So the word and the kind of record keeping comes together. Um, and, uh, and it does coincide again, as you say, with this kind of trade um, in, in, in tattooed um, artifacts. Again, a kind of content warning here, I suppose, um, for oh. images. Um, again, I'll, I'll bring up some images here um, for uh, people. So um, the... Uh, Obviously, the kind of tattooing that was encountered, um, even though, as I, as I said in my the talk last week, there was tattooing and, and quite, quite obviously tattooing in London and Britain, um, even in the years that, that um, Cook left and they'd encountered tattooed populate, the British had encountered tattooed populations in the Americas before, before this as well. Um, but certainly the kind of tattooing that was encountered in the 18th century uh, was very unusual, this big, bold facial tattooing was very striking. Um, Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher, basically said, I really like all this decoration, but why would you do it on your face? You know? okay. um, so that was very unusual and striking. Um, you can see this is a quote from Sidney Parkinson um, describing the process, right? Sidney Parkinson is the draftsman aboard um, the Endeavour. The natives are accustomed to mark themselves in a very singular manner, which they call tattooing. This is done with the juice of a plant. They perform the operation with an instrument having teeth like a comb dipped in the juice with which the skin is perforated. Mr. Stainsby, myself and some others of our company underwent the operation which we had our arms marked. The stain left in the skin, which cannot be effaced without destroying it, is of a lively bluish purple, um, similar to that made upon the skin by gunpowder. Um, and this is, these are some Tahitian uh, tattooing tools that Parkinson drew. Um, but unfortunately, at the same time, right, the idea that um, the, the natives were also a kind of resource to be collected by these Georgian explorers was, was very prevalent. Mm -hmm. And so Joseph Banks in particular, who's depicted here, um, was very interested in tattooing, but was also very interested in the kind of material cultures 
um, of the cultures he was encountering. Um, and here's the image that, um, Here's the, uh, the image, uh, what, the first of the images that's a little bit shocking. Um, it's a practice in New Zealand um, to tattoo, um, to preserve the, the heads of your ancestors, particularly amongst the kind of warrior classes. It's a process called Poimoko. Um, and it's a form of ancestor worship. And these objects are very sacred and they're very um, uh, valuable and important to uh, Maori culture. Um, this is a, um, an image uh, that Parkinson painted called War Canoe. And you can see um, to the left-hand side in the background, someone holding what looks like a kind of skull. Mm -hmm. And that's a preserved tattooed head. And, and they, these, as I said, these, these objects were kept by families. They were also often captured in battle and kept as, and then um, traded uh, back when peace was um, negotiated. Okay. When the um, colonial explorers saw these, you can imagine they became quite... Um, uh, fascinated with them, and many then started being either plundered or bought um, to be put into European museums. And this is a, um, a photograph of a guy called Horatio Robley. He wrote a book, um, uh, actually it's right here, I've got my right here, it's called Maury Tattooing. Um, he documented the practice, but he also started collecting and trading these things. Um, and they ended up, these very sort of sacred ritual objects ended up in European museums. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, um, de demand for these objects outstripped supply. Um, many more of them were wanted by European museums than were available. And so some of the um, chiefs, some of the Maori chiefs, began to tattoo members of their tribe, members of their community, slaves that wouldn't normally have been tattooed, um, certainly not with the extensive moko, which are earned um, by very high-ranking members of the community, um, waiting for those tattoos to heal and then decapitating those slaves and then trading their heads. Okay. Um, many of them now, thankfully, have been repatriated. They've come back to New Zealand, um, but many are still um, in the store house. None of them are on display anymore because I think we realise that displaying them is, is inappropriate. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, they are, many of them still remain in the storehouses of museums across Europe. Um, here's another one of Rob Lee's uh, photographs um, of one that was in the British Museum. Okay, thank you, Matt. Actually, I'm quite mindful of the time. So um, it kind of leads us nicely, I think, into the um, Tattoo Revealed, which is on at Chatham House at the moment. And, right. Um, yeah. Chatham Dockyard, Chatham, not Chatham House. Chatham House. Yes. Chatham Dockyard. I um, went to see it myself the other day and really enjoyed it. Um, it was great, a really good space for it as well. And at the moment, there's not a lot of people going to the museum. So, like, I basically had it, the place to myself, which was great. Um, can, well, yeah. So, what I was going to ask yeah. about that. Um, so, first of all, so the yeah, the reason that you put this together or this is a this is a shot of it while it was being installed. Um, obviously, it, we had to, these are the, some of the images that um, we, I got sent uh, just before we open, just before we were due to open, before we closed down due to coronavirus. So there's some tools and things in the background of some of these pictures. Um, so yeah, the exhibition came together um, originally in 2017 in the National Maritime Museum in Falmer, um, and it was really meant to be a way of telling these stories of, of British tattoo history in a way that was more extensive than had otherwise been done. Um, we're really reliant on the amazing objects that belong to private collectors. Um, Paul uh, Rambo Ramsbottom, uh, Willie Robinson, Neil Hopkins Thomas, Lau Hardy, uh, Jimmy Skews, uh, and um, Alex Binney, um, all private collectors, um, tattooists in, the, in their own right, who lent us objects um, to be able to kind of tell this story in a richer way than was usually possible with the kind of objects that museums had available to them. Um, the show was so successful down in Cornwall that it's been touring the country. Um, as I said, we were slightly impacted by coronavirus, but it's now on and Spain open at the historic dockyard in Chatham in Kent um, it, until, the, until the end of October. Um, and then what? after that, it's going um, up, up north. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's basically a kind of span starting in about 1600, where we started last week, and coming pretty much up to the present day and encompassing really a huge amount of objects from private collections and um, tracing um, a very deep and compl complicated history 
with the maritime material, but also with the kind of wider stories as well. What did you find that people reacted to most um, uh, in, in the museum, in this exhibition? That's a good well, that's a good question. You know, um, one of the, the objects that I'm most, uh, that I, I love the most, and I, I, I've been most proud of being able to put on display, uh -huh. um, is this object, uh, if, which is actually um, a banner, keeping with the maritime theme. Um, uh, now in the collection of an American collector called Darren Bray, but at the time, um, uh, at the time, uh, part of a collection uh, belonging to a guy called Neil Hopkins Thomas. It's the, um, it would have been done, um, so it's a, it's, a p it's a piece of canvas, heavy canvas, about two meters long and about a meter high, um, painted, hand painted very exquisitely with, with designs um, dating from around World War I, um, probably would have been rolled out, would have been rolled out at a port by a portside tattooist when sailors came in um, off the ship so that they could pick their designs. Um, and the designs are really incredible and really beautiful and really exquisite. So this is just a, a couple of zoomed in examples. Um, here's a ship, right? Um, yeah. And I think, you know, this object, as I, it had been unseen really since it was um, put into storage in the 1960s. And certainly even before then, it was not um, often on display. It certainly has never been in a museum before. Yeah. Um, quite detailed and quite beautiful for sort of like flash designs. Absolutely. And I think, yeah. you know, when you think sort of, when you think of tattooing and sailor tattooing a hundred years ago, you do think very rudimentary, you do think very basic, you do think sort of lacking in artistic sophistication. Um, and, you know, I'm very, very proud to be able to put this beautiful object on display um, because it does show that there's a real artistic sensibility and a real complexity. And the show is full of objects like that, you know, individual objects that really transform your instincts, actually, as a visitor, if you don't know anything about tattoo history, of the kind of things that, um, you know, tattooing has to offer. Um, I mean, the same, in the same collection, uh, there are, um, you know, uh, oh, going back the other way, uh, there are, you know, flash designs by... Um, similar artists, uh, if I like bring those up. So it's just, um, it's just been a real privilege. And, you know, and I think what, what I'd be really proud of actually, uh, oh, you're, uh, you need to come with this scene, don't you? Um, what I'm really proud of is being able to make visible something that I think is so often not visible to people. Um, you know, I often say it's, it's images that are often hidden behind, um, shop doors or you know hidden under clothing what i loved as well actually just about the uh, exhibition was the restaging of the tattoo parlor uh i think there was one lal hardy right one, older one than that yeah so a, really we're, nice. again we're um if i yeah we're again fortunate i suppose um that uh you know, we yeah. were able to, to do this. So um, we were able to recreate in real, in, in sort of real size, um, the t two tattoo booths, one from the 1970s and 80s, which belonged to Lal Hardy, and one from the 1960s from the collection of Rambo, uh, Paul Rambo Ramsbottom, depicting uh, Cash Cooper's tattooing in, in Manchester in the 1960s. Um, and, uh, you know, again, those are the kind of um, images uh, things, those kind of experiential things that you can only really get um, in a museum experience in, in a way that, you know, is, is difficult if you're only reliant on the kind of things that museums have traditionally collected. Um, my last question to you before we go over to Matt and, and get some questions from our audience is, was there anything like with feedback or anything, what surprised you the most, <laughs> like from doing this? Well, you know, you can't please all the people all the time. So obviously some people were like, tattoos are disgusting. Um, but I was really, really pleased to see that, for example, people, some people said, I've never been to a museum before. Um, and I didn't realize such a thing could be in a museum. Um, you know, so, so this was a show for people who often, you know, don't f find the kind of art that they love represented in museums. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the, the best reactions I, I thought were, were people who really obviously went in quite skeptical of tattooing, had a particular idea about who got tattooed and, and how. 
um, and really sort of expanded their mindset and thought more, more differently and more expansively about tattooing. And I suppose in particular, my favorites are the, are the people who came in, saw the amazing range of tattooing that was on display, particularly the kind of contemporary tattooing that we've got on display in the hundred hands, this kind of sculptural display of contemporary tattoo art, um, and then went and got tattooed for the first time. You've never considered oh. getting tattooed before. I often say, you know, that um, I've never convinced someone to get a tattoo if you either want one or you don't. But I think the exhibition probably did actually show some people that tattooing um, was something that they might be interested in. Great. Okay. Um, brilliant. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, so um, on the exhibition, if anyone's interested, there's a, um, uh, on BBC iPlayer, uh, you can go on and if you search for culture in quarantine, um, you'll find a short film that the BBC and I made together during lockdown and while the exhibition was closed, which gives you a kind of um, 15 minute overview using images from the show. Um, to really tell a kind of overview of the story of the exhibition. But hopefully you'll be able to make it um, down to Chatham and it's moving up for its final stop to uh, Cumbria. Uh, okay. Okay, uh, so we live around here. Hi Matt, how are you doing? Hey, this, tonight's been brilliant. Well, last week was amazing as well, but I'm glad you've just answered that. So you're saying uh, Kyle Lightfoot wanted to know, is it coming up north? And when you see up north, I think Kyle means in the north of England. Yes, and so... Really, really unfortunately, it was meant to be going to Hull. Uh, it was meant to be in Hull now, um, but because of coronavirus, um, we've just had to extend the stay at Chatham and it, the Hull stop is not going to happen. Um, but it is going to Ferrens Art Gallery um, in Carlisle, uh, which is very north, I know, uh, even if you're in sort of Manchester or Liverpool, but um, it's there, uh, it'll be there until Christmas. Excellent. And uh, thank you for that question. Another question about while we're on the exhibition, have you got anything available in America? Um, have you got anything online? That's from Marcia. And I think that's just in relation to the BBC iPlayer because I don't think iPlayer works outside the UK region. Yeah, the iPlayer is um, unfortunately region locked. So you can, if you email me, uh, I can um, maybe find ways of making some of this available to you. Uh, online. If you search uh, my name, you can find some stuff I've published. Um, unfortunately, there's not as much of my written work out there uh, as I'd like because I haven't finished writing all of it yet. Um, as uh, um, as we said earlier on, I've got a couple of projects on the go. Hopefully, there'll be a book uh, out next year if I finish the damn thing. Uh, <laughs> covering a lot of these stories. Um, but, you know, if there's things you want to know or more detail, like, please do email me. Um, I will put my uh, email address up on the screen uh, shortly. Cool. Well, well, I've got, yeah, I've got a few more questions coming in, um, which if you've got any more questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, I do try and search the chat room as well, but I, we will more likely to answer the ones in the Q&A. Um, a recurring theme tonight, people are really intrigued about the Maori heads and the preserved skin and how, right. how did these museums acquire them, which is always an interesting question. Are you aware of where they, how they came to, were they donated, how did they get them? Right, so um, they were not donated. <laughs> um, well, there are, in, in nearly all cases they weren't donated. So the, the, the Mokor heads were um, either sold, traded, bought from Maori chieftains. And, and of course, don't forget the, even if it was bought, the, the economic relationships are very um, unequal um, and the power relationships are very unequal. So even those that were sold, I think, were, would be difficult just to, to view that as an ethical transaction. Um, many of them would have just been plundered um, taken, you know, as part of conquest. So that's that's the New, Ze that's the, um, the, 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 the New Zealand ones. Um, there are records, for example, of the um, the draftsman on the Beagle, the ship that Charles Darwin was on, uh, having his cartouche wrapped in the skin of a tattooed native who died. Um, so the trade in, in, in skins is a, is a pretty, a human remains, is a pretty dark, obviously, part of, of, of this story. And, and I really don't want to kind of underplay how horrific it was. The, the, the sailor tattoos, like the ones I showed you earlier on in a glass jar, um, they would have just been collected fairly routinely, probably, as uh, when sailors were autopsied. Um, it was pretty Wild West, really. It was pretty standard for um, pathologists and doctors at the end of the 19th century to just, if they, something interesting came across their 
desk, they just cut it off and keep it. So, um, and often that would be used for, for training medical students. Um, if you go to the Gordon Museum or if you go to the Bartholomew, you know, St. Bartholomew's, or if you go to the Royal Museum of Surgeons, for example, in London, there's a lot of those kind of medical specimens. And tattooing sort of fell into that. Um, medical surgeons and pathologists just sort of thought tattoos were interesting and they cut them off and keep them. Someone did once send me a photograph of a preserved human arm um, that had come out of a medical collection in Scotland. Um, there are many, uh, the biggest collection of these in Britain are actually dry preserved, not wet preserved. Um, they're sort of tanned like leather. They're actually French uh, in origin. And my colleague, Dr. Gemma Angel, who works at the University of Leicester, has written a lot about them. Um, they were collected from, um, again, sort of a pathologist in Paris, seemed to largely be servicemen, maybe also criminals. Um, and again, they wouldn't have been collected with any kind of permission. They just would have been things that came across the surgeon's desks. Um, there are examples um, in the 20th century, oh. particularly in Japan, where some Japanese specimens were donated willingly, um, you know, with, with the ex expectation that they'd be preserved after death. Um, but most of those early preservation specimens, specimens are you know, just things that um, would, have, would have been uh, sort of taken off the bodies at, at that moment they, when they were being used. Come to you there, Matt. Cool. Um, yeah, you, you're dipping in and out on sound again, Matt, just be aware. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, no sorry. Worries. When you turn your head, I think you move away from the yeah, microphone. Yeah, I think my microphone, yeah. No worries. Um, can we just, we'll try and do some quick ones. I, they're so interesting, <laughs> I know why you'll go on. Um, so Julie wants to know, what were the sanitation conditions like on ships when they were tattooing with their needles? I know you talked about them licking before, but yeah, um, um, you know, not not obviously not not that sanitary. Um, although, actually, funnily enough, um, really serious health outbreaks weren't that serious. At least, at least not in the British Navy. Um, tattooing was banned in the French Navy in the 1860s because of a hepatitis outbreak, um, and uh, so. Again, one of the reasons that tattooing got so stigmatized in, in Europe was because it was banned in the navies much earlier than it, it, it was in Britain. Um, the, you know, they, there was obviously kind of syphilis happening, licking of the needles, but they were also, you know, they were uh, dipping their, they were you know, um, burning their needles on flames and they were using uh, often alcohols um, as their suspension liquid. So there was sort of some rudimentary sterilization. And certainly, you know, when the professional tattoo industry started in the 19th century, in the 1880s, a big um, part of their advertising actually was anti-sepsis. So I think it was really quite clear to the professional tattooers that marketing themselves um, in a way that meant you, were, you weren't going to get infec infections um, was probably a good way to go. Um, yeah. Oh, cool. I mean, the human body is pretty resilient, right? Um, if you do get an infection from tattooing, it's, it's, it's pretty bad news, but um, it's not, it's much less common, I think, than you'd imagine, historically speaking. Um, another, hopefully, this is good. Did Sir um, Nicholas II have tattoos also? Yes. Yeah, oh, that's a nice one. <laughs> <laughs> quick, quick answer. Yeah, he, he, was tattooed, he was tattooed in Japan, and actually there are... There are some photographs of him, um, unlike of George, uh, with his sleeves rolled up. So, yeah, he, he, he was tattooed for sure. When you were talking about the dragon tattoo before, Olivia did ask, was it, I'm going to, please, I um, apologise for pronouncing it, Hori Chow? Was it yes. Hori Yeah, it was. Yes. Right. So, well, um, well, the actual answer to that is it, it wasn't Hori Chio, actually, but Hori Chio certainly took the credit for it. Um, some good research by um, an, a Japanese, uh, British Japanese academic called Norobo Koyama um, did some research in Japan and, and suspects with very good evidence that Chio would have been too young um, to have carried out the tattoos at the time. Um, but uh, certainly Hori Chio went on to really sort of take credit for that tattooing. In fact, um, uh, myself, um, but in particular my colleague uh, Yoshimi Yamamoto in uh, Yokohama is doing lots of new research on Horichio. So there's lots more of his story that um, I'm, I can't reveal to you right now, but uh, we're figuring out a lot more about him than we knew before. Essentially, um, what's really interesting about that Japanese moment is that 
loads of tattooers claimed to be Horichio or to have been cha- trained by him without much evidence as well. So sort of several layers of myth and misconception about his influence. But certainly he was like famous for having tattooed the, the king. What's well, really interesting, you made a, a reference to the Renaissance painting and I just mm-hmm. even the way you were talking about, you know, people copying styles, it's very similar. There's lines which draw across quite, you know, lots of similarities. So yeah, that's really interesting. Um oh last, that, last one. Last one. Oh, there's so many good questions. Oh, oh. right. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to <laughs> um I'm going to go for, there's lots of logistical ones which we can answer in the text. (laughs) Um, I'm going to go for, did the Japanese also have special techniques which differed from Europe? Um, Yeah. Um, Yes. So again, I could do a whole talk about the, about Japanese tattooing and particularly it's, it's um, relationship with Britain. Um, Although, so the Japanese tended to use kind of longer handle. So they, they didn't do tapping. Uh, like um, like the Polynesians did, but they used kind of long um, implements. So uh, that said, they also um, used, and certainly kind of on encounter with, with the British, used shorter handled needles. So if I bring up some images here, let me find the right um, uh, image here. So... Um, What's really interesting about the Japanese stuff, you can see here in this image of George, they're using these kind of small, um, oh, I haven't put it live. Um, You can see these kind of small, like pencil-like implements. And actually very quickly, European tattooers took that on and started importing tools from Japan. So um, very quickly, that Japanese way of doing things um, caught on. Uh, in Britain. This is a guy called Tom Riley tattooing in the Japanese style. Um, what's really interesting about this as well, though, is that there was innovation going the opposite direction. So Japanese tattooing didn't have colours um, other than red uh, before the uh, 1880s. And it was actually European and American innovation in pigment uh, for tattooing that led to a big explosion of colours in different in Japanese tattooing, because that really wasn't present in in Japanese tattooing in the 19th century. So again, I could do a whole talk about this really, but there's the, the unlike um, Polynesian tattooing, Japanese tattooing is really an art, an art form first and a cultural practice second. Um, and that artistic kind of, um, that, 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 the fact that it's not so related to any kind of normative cultural practice just meant it was much easier for Europeans to engage with it, to learn from it um, and to kind of adapt it for their own uh, requirements. Um, I mean, I've got some, you can see here, like this is, this is uh, Sutherland MacDonald, who's an important early professional British tattooer, um, using not just his own electric device in the middle there, but also these um, Japanese um, handled uh, needle I, I think there's a whole second series um, for tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could, I could talk that. about this for literally hours, <laughs> as, as well people are realising. Um, uh, Oh, here's some, here's, some, here's some of the longer handled ones. So you can see here, this is Tom Riley's setup. On the left, you can just about make out there, again, if I make it big, um, you can just about make out these longer handled Japanese um, handles on the left. Matt, before you give all the goods away, um, I, um, I do think this could be a second series. I'm going to do some plugs and um, promote the, what we have at the museum at the moment and what's coming up um, because... It's not just this program. If you're new to RMG, there's lots of other exciting things um, coming up. But what first thing I do advise you, if you want a second series, tweet us at, at RM Greenwich. Like, just say how good you the, the session's been with Matt. And that's one way to make sure there'll be a second series if if Matt's willing and Elmer's willing as yeah, well. So, all and, and look, you know, there's also, there's also some amazing, uh, the next week's talk is going to be really fantastic. And I'm really excited yes. about that. Um, things I don't know about and uh, stories that um, a, a, a tattoo historian, uh, amateur tattoo historian, but brilliant, brilliant researcher called Terry Manton uncovered the story of um, a very important um, sort of forgotten pioneer of, um, of, of, of tattooing in Blackpool, a woman um, by the name of Dorothy Hayward. Um, and I'm just really thrilled to 
to hear that so there's loads more good stuff coming yeah i'm really up. excited i'm excited about that next week and the week after with uh Gemma and samantha who are two tattoo artists young women doing it now um and i just want to say like i hope that um actually it's sort of that tattoo histories can inform us as we hear from matt about society as much as any object in a museum i think right. you've uh, the last two, this this one tonight and the one you've done before has to told us a lot about our culture, about what was going on, about what they see, reflecting what they see. So um, I think it's been great, Matt. Really thank you very much. And oh, well, thank you so much. Go, just get the plug I was... <laughs> oh, no, go for your plug, oh, yeah. for sure. The plug is important. Go on, Matt. I just to let you know... If you're enjoying um, the, the, the format of these panel discussions, next Tuesday we have one on the theme of hidden nature. Um, we are looking at the trade of uh, natural commodities and how it, and the consequences um, it affects us in today. So we've got a um, fantastic panel in Dr. Robert Blythe. We've got um, Abby um, Glencross, who is... Uh, a special scientist who has been learning how to look at growing meat, um, a special vegan looking at resources. So looking how we look after natural resources and where they come from and the consequences, especially in regards to the slave trade um, and the transatlantic um, slave triangle. So we're looking at how we deal with those consequences. It's part of a festival we are running next week. Um, which relates to the building, which you can see on the screen now, which is the Prince Philip Maritime Collection Centre. A lot of the items which Matt has pulled out are stored there. Uh, this is the centre where we store our collection, but it's not just a store which is private, it is accessible, and we would like you to access it next week. I've just put a link on there now, so you can see what's coming up um, in the festival next week, and then... Um, yeah, so hopefully see you next Tuesday at our panel discussion for that and go and see all the other great events we've got on that week as well. Yeah, I've had a sneak preview. You. It looks really good. Um, so definitely, and please come back next week for Terry Manton and Dot Haywood. Matt, thank you so much, not just for uh, your two presentations and discussions here, but also for all the help you've given me and all the things that you sent me to read. You've been thank a really you. Thank you so, so much, much for all the great questions. Thank <laughs> you for the expert on shark biology who's given me a kind of lesson on shark teeth biology. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah thank thank you so much uh for all the amazing questions i've really realized people are more confident asking questions on chat than uh, they are often normally in um uh in person so um, that bodes well for my teaching that begins in the next couple of weeks so thank you very very much thank you um elmer and thank you um uh, shahira and matt for yes. your help as well normally i say that afterwards but i realize when we log off that you know I, it's gone i can't say thank you afterwards so thank you so much um for all of your help and i'm going to be in the audience next week i think um and if i can good luck be. with your books good luck with no, your well books. I've, uh, I've got to get on with it so thank you very yeah. much all right and thank you again to matt that you're here in the background cheers to matt hopefully we'll see everybody back next week thank you thank you cheers bye